Hey guys, CJ from Elevated Systems. And a few months ago, I shared with you the initial iteration of an enclosure designed to house a framework laptop mainboard along with a dedicated graphics card. This is the final version of that 3D printed project. The project files are on my GitHub and you can print this case if you want. However, before you do, consider the enemy of 3D printed plastic, heat. And the framework mainboard produces a lot of heat. I went through several iterations and the final enclosure is designed to minimize heat related issues as much as possible, but the constant heating and cooling cycles might potentially cause the case to eventually warp. Because of that, I crave something crafted from more robust materials like steel with a refined and classy finish that matches my desk setup like black walnut. So I built just that. This is the upgraded version of the framework laptop mainboard and GPU enclosure. And today I'm going to show you how I built it. And for all you DIY enthusiasts out there, stick around to the end and I'll tell you how you can build one too. So the first thing on my to-do list was redesign the case. After working with the initial 3D printed enclosure, I realized there was some changes I wanted to implement. One major adjustment was moving away from the slide-in setup. It proved challenging to access components like the front fan and USB-C PCB. Instead, I decided to create the final case in two main components. The actual case, which would house all the components and features a wide open design for easy access and installation, and a simple well-ventilated top cover. This approach would not only simplify the build, but also enhance accessibility and airflow within the enclosure. With the design all wrapped up, it was time to bring this project to life. I had a pretty clear plan in mind. Most of the chassis would be made from 22 gauge steel, the external panels would be laser cut from walnut, and the cover would be crafted from three millimeter cast acrylic. However, there was a little snag. I didn't have a laser cutter, and honestly, I don't know the first thing about using one. So, like many of us do these days, I turned to YouTube for some guidance. I quickly discovered that a diode laser would be perfect for my needs, and the X-Tool desktop diode laser series was getting a lot of love from makers in that niche. So, I went ahead and added the X-Tool D1 Pro 20 watt desktop laser engraver cutting machine to my cart ready to check out, but then I did something a bit out of character. I shot off an email to Xtool asking if they'd be willing to send me a D1 Pro for use in my projects. To my surprise, they not only sent me the D1 Pro, but also its enclosure, the honeycomb panel, and the air assist. Their only request was for me to use it in a few videos, however I wanted, and share my thoughts with my audience. Well, since I was planning to buy it myself and do just that, those terms worked out great. Now, there was still the issue of not having a clue about how to operate this shiny new machine, but no kidding. After watching a few instructional videos by some incredibly knowledgeable creators and following the step-by-step -step assembly instructions from Xtool, I went from having a bunch of boxes to actually producing these components in just one morning but I'll circle back to the laser cutting part in a bit. First, let's take a step back and walk through the fabrication and assembly process in a more logical order. And I'll tell you about how straying from that plan led to some interesting challenges. The first components I tackled were the steel panels, the bottom panel, the mainboard panel, and the GPU tray. I cut some 22 gauge mild steel sheet to rough size. Typically, this is where the tedious task of applying the messy blue marking dye, followed by careful measurements and marking of cut and bend patterns would come into play. However, I had another idea in mind. I knew a 20 watt diode laser couldn't cut 22 gauge steel. I mean, you need a plasma cutter for that, but I was fairly certain it would etch the steel. So I exported the patterns from Fusion 360 and imported them directly into the Xtool Creative Space software. I set the laser to score the lines at 100% power and a speed of like three millimeters per second. After securing and framing my sheet metal, the laser 
accurately scored the pattern directly into the steel. No more marking die, no more measuring 10 times and still getting something wrong. What would typically take me a few hours, I completed in under an hour. I was then able to follow the cut lines to make the final cuts using my plate metal shears. In fact, my shears easily grabbed into the very light score marks, making it super easy to cut exactly along the lines. From there, I precisely pre-drilled the rivet and screw holes and lined up the score lines in my metal brake to bend the bannels to their desired shape. Well, almost perfectly, a bit of fine tuning with an anvil and a mallet straightened them out. Metal work is part science, part art. Once the panels were formed, I used a torch and some metalwork solder to attach the standoffs for the main board and PCI board. After cleaning and priming the panels, I riveted them together, which because of the perfectly placed holes, worked out perfectly. In addition to these three panels, there are also front and rear panels with more intricate 3D designs. For these, I reverted back to 3D printing. However, this time I opted for resin printed parts using an ABS-like resin. Unfortunately, it turned out to be far from ABS-like and the front panel easily cracked while I was riveting it on. Fortunately, I had anticipated this possibility and had some actual ABS FDM printed spares ready to go. Since only cool air flows in through the front, heat shouldn't be a problem here. Now, with the internal structure of the chassis complete, what I should have done was double check the dimensions, make any necessary changes to the design, and then proceed to laser cut the external walnut panels. However, my enthusiasm for my shiny new laser got the better of me, and the wood panels were actually the very first thing I cut. And I have to admit, they turned out beautifully, meticulously cut to the precise measurements I had designed them to. The problem, when Fusion 360 bends sheet metal, it does it with uncanny precision, achieving those perfect 90 degree bends with the diameter exactly matching the thickness of the steel. Unfortunately, I'm not as precise in my steel bending skills as a computer program, so here I am with these wood panels cut to fit the perfectly bent steel, and they don't quite line up with my hand-built frame. Now, I did anticipate some of this, which is why I chose solid 1 8 inch walnut project boards instead of plywood. This choice allowed me to sand down some of the inconsistencies. Of course, I could have fixed and recut the panels. After all, the D1 Pro can knock them out in a matter of minutes. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough material left over, and for reasons that will become clear as we dive further into this video, time wasn't on my side. So my solution, eh, filling in the gaps with some two-part wood filler. You know, the Mythbusters once proved that you can, in fact, polish your turd. With that said, let's rewind and uncover a couple of more, oh crap, moments. My original plan called for a standard 120 by 25 millimeter front fan. I would have installed it from the back using these familiar fan screws you'd use to attach a fan to a radiator. But at the last minute, I decided to opt for a slim 15 millimeter Arctic P12 fan, which means these screws are too long. So I went ahead and screwed it in from the front before gluing on the wood panels. Now it's a permanently attached fan and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it never fails. I also forgot to include this filter mesh between the ABS and wood panel. Not a project killer, Everything will still work just fine. I'll just need to dust things out a bit more frequently. Now, onto the last piece for the main case of top reel. I crafted from 1 8 by 3 quarter inch aluminum flat bar. This sturdy rail not only provides much needed structural rigidity, but also plays home to the power switch with a custom resin printed button. I also need to mention the power button connects to the main board using a pretty neat little adapter made by Crimeer is a member of the framework development community. With the case all wrapped up, the only thing left on the fabrication list was the top cover. So I double checked the measurements, made any necessary adjustments to the plans, and then proceeded to cut the panel, right? Well, of course not. As soon as I finished cutting the wood, I couldn't resist the temptation to slide that big sheet of three millimeter acrylic into the laser cutter and see how it worked. 
The D1 Pro made light work of cutting out all of these three and five millimeter hex holes cleanly and effortlessly. It scored the bend locations and cut out the final shape like the Pro it is. And then of course, I managed to mess up the bend like the amateur I am. Now, here's the deal. I always shape cast acrylic using hot air. I've never had much luck with hot wire or infrared heaters. You've really got to shell out over $500 for a good one. Also, I wouldn't typically use my metal brake to bend acrylic unless I planned on sanding and painting the part, which is exactly what I did here. It actually worked great, giving me a straight, tight bend. Unfortunately, the score marks I made were intended for the center of the bend, but I lined them up on the outside of the bend. Three millimeter acrylic has a three millimeter bend diameter, so my panel ended up about a millimeter and a half too wide on each side. It's not the end of the world, but it's not quite up to my standard, so I will be cutting a new piece of acrylic, but there's another reason for ordering more acrylic. I've also had a change of heart regarding how I want to secure the cover. Originally, the plan was to use a few of these small countersunk screws along the bottom edge, but that would ruin the sleek look I'm aiming for. Instead, I've decided to go with neodymium magnets. I can use the laser to engrave pockets on the inside edge of the acrylic when I recut it, and then I'll attach another set of magnets on the inside of the case. While I won't be picking up the case by the cover, it should do a pretty solid job of holding it in place. Now, despite Encountering a few hiccups along the way, the case is essentially constructed and it's time to build the PC. First things first, the framework mainboard doesn't have a PCIe slot, so I'll be using a Thunderbolt to PCIe adapter. I'm currently using one I cannibalized from my Razer Chroma eGPU enclosure, but I could also opt for this ADT Link PCIe adapter, which can use either an M.2 NVMe or Thunderbolt to connect to the mainboard. Inside the PCIe adapter, I've slotted in an NVIDIA RTX A2000 professional graphics card. And for this build, I'm using my Intel 1260p framework mainboard, which screws onto the left side of the case. And everything is powered by a 250 watt TFX power supply that neatly slides into the rear of the case. The front fan connects to the fan header on the PCIe adapter, the USB-C breakout connects to the mainboard, and we're good to go. Now, despite the challenges we've encountered and even before I recut the top cover, I have to say, this case looks great. Of course, I'm completely biased here. I carefully selected the materials and finishes, building it to my preference. But the beauty of DIY is that if you decide to grab the files and build it yourself, you can tailor it to your own taste. Maybe you wanna go with maple panels and a white cover. Don't like the hex pattern? Change it up. Don't have a low profile graphics card like the A2000 or maybe the low profile RTX 4060? Well, that might pose a challenge. I designed this case specifically for low profile graphics cards, but I designed this one to hold full side graphics cards and a lot more. Okay, I know this is just a pile of parts, but in my mind when planning this video, it was a finished product and this was an awesome surprise reveal. Why it's still a pile of parts, I'll explain in a bit. What the pile of parts is, well, this stack of components represents the beginnings of an identical but significantly larger enclosure. When it's finished, this case will not only accommodate full-size graphics cards, but also the main board with my cooler mod, leaving space for the stock framework battery and a standard SFX power supply with a 140 millimeter fan cooling it. I'll be building this one in the exact same manner as I did this one, except I'll be using glossy black acrylic for external panels and this stainless steel mesh for the top cover, which I'll polish to a nice shine. The front intake grill will also be a piece of this seamlessly inset into the acrylic panel. As you can see, I'm doing this one right. I'll laser cut the acrylic after I finish the metal work and I'll fabricate the top cover last. Now you also might be wondering why there were so many mistakes in unfinished work. Well, first of all, I don't believe in hiding my mistakes. DIY and custom fabrication aren't always perfect. 
stuff happens, and sometimes it's crucial as a creator to showcase your mistakes and share how you prevent them. It's all part of the learning process. However, in a final production, I typically present a more polished and complete project. To be real with you, I did all of this in just two days, then I had to put it on hold for a few days while I worked on my review of the AMD Framework laptop. The plan was to come back and fix and finish everything this entire week, but instead, I filled, stained, and finished this little case last night so I could film this today so I can get on a plane tomorrow and go spend the week visiting my granddaughters. I love my viewers and I wanted to show you all the progress on this project, but I miss my grandbabies and family is the most important thing. While I still have more work to do on my AMD framework review series when I get home, which in reality is just about an hour before this video will go live, winters are long here in Colorado, so I've decided to finish and share the rest of this project's journey in a series of shorts. Now, before I wrap up, I have to give a massive shout out to Xtool for sending over the D1 Pro. While I may not have enough experience to claim that the Xtool is the definitive laser engraver and cutting machine above all others, I can tell you this. Going from knowing absolutely nothing to producing perfect parts on the D1 Pro was faster and easier than with any other maker machine or tool I've ever owned. I couldn't have executed this project as I envisioned and designed it without the laser, and you can bet I'll be put into work on many more projects in the future. With that said, if a new laser engraver and cutting machine happens to be on your radar, there is an affiliate link in the description below. Using that link for your purchase will provide a small commission to me, which I'll reinvest directly into projects like this, and it, there's no additional cost to you. However, if you're interested in building this, you can grab my open source files and tackle this enclosure project on your own, but fear not, you don't need a fancy laser or any big expensive tools, all the sheet metal work is pretty straightforward and can be accomplished using simple hand tools like these shears and this hand metal seamer. Heck, you might not even need any tools at all. A quick Google search might lead you to free maker spaces right in your own area. Many local libraries like the ones here in Colorado offer resources like 3D printers, laser cutters, and a bunch of other tools that you can use usually for the price of a library card. And if those options don't quite fit the bill, there are plenty of local businesses or online sources where you can send your plans and they'll fabricate the parts or even the entire project for you, usually at a relatively reasonable price. The point is you can choose to do as little or as much hands-on work as you're comfortable with, or you can just kick back and enjoy watching me build stuff. That's cool too. As we wrap up this journey of creating a scratch-built case for the Framework laptop mainboard, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you for joining me. From challenges to triumphs, DIY is all about learning, pushing limits, and creating something special. Keep innovating, creating, and stay tuned for more exciting tech DIY projects. Thanks for being a part of this amazing community, and I'll catch you in the next one.